Good morning, everybody. I'm waking up to some very interesting toes. They're not happy with the fact that I wore racing flats yesterday and ran fast. And I'm looking outside and it is windy and snowing and gray. Doesn't look like a fun day to be out there, but here we go. I'm sitting in the car listening to the master and his emissary as the wind rages outside. <laughs> and he's talking about the left hemisphere's need to categorize things, to divide things, to put them into very neat boxes uh, that are very clearly defined. And that it doesn't like things that move. It doesn't like things that grow or shift or change or can't be pinned down. Whereas the right hemisphere deals with things in context. So something is moving through a scene. The left hemisphere only cares about the thing that's moving. And it's like, how do we stop it from moving so that we can look at it, so that we can observe it? There are a lot of things that don't fit into neat categories because they're moving, because they're changing, they're shifting. Uh, sometimes it's people. And this is one of the things that I've dealt with for the majority of my life, trying to figure out where I fit because my left hemisphere is trying to put me in a category and none of them really ever seem to feel like home. And I've always felt like an outsider. Uh, whereas now, um, I don't put myself in a category anymore. I'm not trying to have a label that describes me. I'm allowing myself to flow and grow and just be Tim, whatever that is. Uh, I don't know. And that's fascinating to me now because I get to find out. And one of the things I'm gonna find out is that I'm evolving. Uh, rather than knowing exactly who I am and being confident there and, and being able to communicate that. So as I'm listening to him talk about paradoxes that arise from the left's inability to deal with moving and growing objects. I'm thinking about cinematography and frame rate. For instance, I'm filming right now in 30 frames per second because the new software update in the iPhone that happened last night is giving me two options, 30 frames and 60 frames. Um, 24 frames seems to have disappeared. Anyway, in cinematography, in the movies, they shoot in 24 frames per second because it creates what they call motion blur. So you look at my fingers and it's hard to see them clearly. You see a motion blur, uh, but this is 30 frames a second. So you're gonna see them a little more clearly than you would in a film. And the reason that they've chosen this 24 frames a second is that the motion blur that's created on screen is similar to what your eye sees in the world. That when we look at moving objects, we don't really see them clearly moving. We see them kind of fuzzy. But now a lot of people are shooting in 60 frames a second because it captures the action. So movement is much more crisp and clear and unnatural. That our brain likes things that are a bit blurry when they're moving. That's what it's used to. And that's the right hemisphere. The right hemisphere is like, yeah, things are blurry. Things are fuzzy. We can't really grasp them. Uh, if we know where the electron is, we can't know its trajectory or how fast it's moving. And if we know how fast it's moving, we don't know exactly where it is. This is a left hemisphere problem in quantum physics, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. The right hemisphere has no problem with this. It's like, yeah, things are blurry when they move and, and there's no finitude. We don't know exactly what's going on. And that's okay because there's a context. So this move in cinematography towards higher and higher frame rates to capture the action and to make it more precise uh, may look good in some contexts, but in other contexts, it just seems strange. Like when ultra high definition TVs came out and you're looking at these actors and they look like real people with real skin and real light. And it's like, ooh, wow, that's too much. I don't want to see people 
uh, in that level of clarity. It doesn't look real. It looks ultra real. Um, humans tend to prefer things that are a little fuzzier, a little softer, a little less defined when we're emotionally engaging with something. Right hemisphere. But the left hemisphere is like, nope, clear as possible. That's what we want. That's what we're going to move towards. And you're going to see cameras with higher and higher and higher frame rates becoming available to the population so that we don't ever have to be surprised by what's happening in the midst of movement. Because uh, that makes us feel safe. Cold, windy, and snowy on the mountain today. One of the things I do to get myself moving on a cold, windy day like this is to get dressed and then sit here in the studio for a while or wherever I am and not have the clothing linked to running. So I'm trying to separate the act of getting dressed and the act of running. That way getting dressed doesn't become something I avoid. And after being in the studio for now, probably 20 minutes wearing these clothes, I'm kind of toasty. So I want to get outside, I want to move, I want to cool off a little bit. So now I'm going to start the run warm. And that is a big deal for me because if I go out there and I'm cold, and I'm bracing against it, that's gonna make the run very difficult and I'm likely to not even continue. I may just turn right around. So by feeling warm and then going outside and being warm for the beginning of it and probably the whole run, uh, I'm much more likely to get it done and have it be a gentle experience because that's my goal, gentleness. No willpower, no force, no discipline, gentleness. Here we go. Love these old marble sidewalks. This is a ginkgo biloba tree, one of the oldest tree species in the world. And they lose their leaves all at once, like within an hour. Whew. Little pump track that the board that I sit on helped to build. Give something for the kids in the community to do. It's fun to run. Vermont's first magnet hospital. Is that because they have big magnets and their MRI right there in that tractor trailer? What does magnet hospital mean? I was born in that building right there. Somebody's got a warm little spot over there, huh? You like it by the fire, mama? This is Wolfie, otherwise known as the Wu-Tang Kitten. And she's taking me into her room. She likes to take me in here because this is where we first met when she was a kitchen. Kitchen? A kitten. You're not a kitchen. This is where we first met. So every day she takes me in here so we can hang out and spend some time together. Just like in the old days, right Wolf? Oh, good girl. Good girl. Such a good girl. Such a good girl. I just finished an hour and 50 minutes on the elliptical machine. I watched two episodes of the TV show Limitless, which I've been watching for I think a couple weeks now. 
Uh, it's based on the movie from 2011 with Bradley Cooper, but isn't nearly as good. Anyway, it helps me pass the time. Uh, and I've been watching a lot of movies on the elliptical, but there are so many bad movies out there. <laughs> At least with a TV show, you know you're going to get a consistent level of quality. Even if the quality is, say, a 6 out of 10, you know you're going to get a 6 every time. Uh, and it doesn't stress me out. A lot of films really stress me out because I feel the situation or the characters and often it's too much. Can't take it. Anyway, um, I have a disclaimer to make about my use of the elliptical machine. A lot of people think that I know what I'm doing and that I've got some plan for it, but really I'm just experimenting. I haven't studied the biomechanics of the elliptical movement or at least this particular stride pattern on this machine. All I know is that my quads, glutes, and hamstrings fire in a way that feels very similar to a racing stride, but in slow motion. And there's none of the intensity that's going to get me injured. My injuries generally come from smashing my toes, twisting my ankles, banging my knees, running downhill, um, and a lot of pavement uh, stressing my Achilles. So this allows me to increase my volume. I started doing like 15 minute sessions because it sucks and it's hard. And then I got up to 30 minute sessions and I thought that would be the limit, like 30 minutes of this thing a day, I'm done. Now, most days are an hour and a half. For a while, I was doing two hours a day for a couple months straight. Um, so it's allowed me to increase my training volume. My heart rate is really low when I'm on the machine, but my legs are not happy. It's kind of like cycling. I can't really get my heart rate up on a bike, but my legs are like, oh! This is kind of the same way, but it's mostly my glutes. So I've increased my training volume. I've put some strain, some load on some muscles that are important to running, and I've seen a big difference in how they look and feel. I have a butt now, it's kind of crazy. And uh, it's allowed me to also keep moving, which is really, really important for my well-being and mental health. But this is an experiment. I don't know where it's gonna go. I don't know what it's gonna lead to. I'm gonna slowly increase running volume and see what happens when I do elliptical running volume and my Bigfoot stride. But that too, Bigfoot, is an experiment. My boot slogs are an experiment. I've had my fastest spring racing seasons after a winter of boot slogging, which is heavy winter boots up to my knee, running in the snow at like a 20 minute mile, like Rocky IV. <laughs> That's where I got the idea. I thought no one could do that. And then I started doing it a little at a time and eventually built up to you know, a couple hours I could do it experiment and yet that i know leads to super fast road racing in the spring uh, same with the bigfoot stride i've had my fastest times in the past i'd say eight years my fastest 5k in the past eight years was when i was 49 years old uh, and it was after doing a lot of bigfoot stride and last summer uh, when i broke the american record in the mile for 50 year olds uh, I was walking and doing Bigfoot stride. That's all I did all summer. I did very little running. Um, and the running I did was mostly plotting, but did tons and tons of Bigfoot stride for hours and then ran a 441 mile uh, with no speed work at all. So this has been an experiment that I've been running since 2013 when my Achilles bone spurs showed up and I was told I would never run again. So I retired in 2013 and everything I've done since then has been an experiment. Um, and it's more fun that way. I'm not locked into the standard model of running and what I see all of my friends and competitors going through where they're aging and people that there was no way I could keep up with them 10 years ago they're now way behind me uh, and I'm excited to keep looking around and playing and seeing what's possible. 
that's what running raw started as and running raw continues, but it's not about raw food. It's about a, a raw state of openness to possibility and to experience. And my original tagline was to see what's possible and to be what's possible. And that's what this is about. I'm seeing what's possible. I don't know. But it's a hell of a lot more fun than doing the same old thing that everybody else is doing, getting injured, getting older, and slowing down. I'll take this any day, even if I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> All right, I'll see you tomorrow.